This video is sponsored by Crimson Manifesto, Knuckles OX, and Baba Snake. We resume during a tense but faithful meeting, decades in the making, as near identical eyes lock and leave little doubt for their owners that the man they are looking at, despite how wildly impossible or coincidental it may seem, truly is their long lost brother. However, where Turles only seems to grow more boisterous and jovial with this realization, Bardock is left shaken once again, as not only is his younger brother's survival an unexpected turn to events, but one which contradicts the very narrative he'd written for himself since their parting, as his ambition to never fail as badly as he did back then on Planet Desert was the very thing that pushed him to surpass Cognac and leave him to be remembered as even less than low-class trash, rather than his father and the first link in a chain of losers. Feeling the same thing in some indescribable way, Turles quite casually greets his brother, advancing on him while sarcastically asking how long it has been since they last saw each other. All the while, he taps his scouter to try and get another accurate read on Bardock's power now that he's closer. This, as well as his own cunning destroyer instinct, reveals that while his sibling is currently still relatively fresh compared to Gas, whom after after a conniption in his unleashed form suffered a kind of overheating, which has left him in this current incapacitated state. He certainly couldn't overpower him fully in his base form, even if he wanted to. And what's more, he's visibly more exhausted by the effort it took to pull off that slick victory against Gas than he's trying to let on. Knowing this full well himself, and more importantly, wanting desperately to understand what's going on and what's happened to his little brother, Bardock opts to negotiate first, even if it comes out. as a harsh demand for Turs to drop his theatrics in Melodroppa and explain what the fuck is going on and why in Hiffel he get himself wrapped up with the heaters. However, all this accomplishes is getting Turles' facade of savage joviality in disregard to slip for an instant, as it's clear he's not comfortable with someone speaking to him with more flippant familiarity than even Alec has shown him. Because of this, he scowls at Bardock deeply while removing his cloak, as he takes it from this response that clearly his envoy's message wasn't understood. Oh well, some messages are best delivered personally at the end of a fist. Meanwhile, back with the rest of our heroes, the arrival of Prince Vegeta serves as a ray of hope for only Nappa while Raditz is hit with yet another wild wave of recognition and just the slightest itty bitty amount of guilt. At the same time, Goku and Granola feel a strange sensation that instinctively elicits an intense desire to fight and kill this new cocky little Saiyan respectively. As for the rest of our heroes, though they are beaten and bloodied, most currently unconscious in the cases of the Earthlings among them, those remaining can already tell that there is no winning this confrontation as things stand, and so quickly begin looking for a way to evacuate the wounded and regroup. However, Kami and Monaito intervene with a plan, informing the group via telepathy that they've gathered the gist of the situation and began their efforts to support the plan's defenders, the first goal in doing so being to get everyone out of danger, treat their injuries, and reconvene with a plan to deal with this new ominous threat. Thus, Monaito and the Papaya Island crew have already been picked up by Mr. Popo and dropped off at the lookout, while the next stop is Devilman, who is in critical condition after having helped Bardock against one of the first invaders. When it comes time to enter the areas where Turles and Vegeta currently reside, however, more caution is needed, as while the genie's carpet is quick, it isn't quick enough to escape the notice or destruction of these monsters. Considering this before most in their party even have time to, Raditz attempts to keep us calm and multitask, responding with fairly genuine fear and shock at Vegeta's appearance in a slightly sniveling way on the outside. While in his mind, he tells Kami, Monaito, and Popo not to hesitate and to get his brothers, moms, and the others out of here for now, so they don't give an opportunity attack in their retreat. Then showing his cowardice isn't all gone, he asks them to please make sure they come back for him later, since at least for now, the prince like Nappa only has eyes for him, as there's no way he'd be willing to kill Raditz without making him do some growling first to stroke his ego, though there's no telling how long that'll last. Muzli and Gine have qualms with this course of action for obvious reasons, not being willing to leave Raditz alone like this, much less get further away from helping Bardock, but it's the scarred Saiyan himself and Goku who rallies their family and friends and gives them heart and strength, and showing just how much both his power, perception, and empathy have grown, Bardock reveals that he has picked up on the chatter from so far across the world, and seconds Raditz's idea, since as a former soldier, he knows for now their best bet is trying to stall and de-escalate the situation, while Goku without permission points out that everyone is being a bit silly if they really think he and Granola are going to bail on Raditz, and thus they stand in the way of Vegeta with him, as Popo arrives, retrieves the other fighters, and successfully brings them back to the impromptu maid med bay on the lookout, without interference, where Monite was in the middle of healing Spike. As she'll be prioritized via triage next, Kine is initially insisting that they get two of their forces back on the board on both fronts, even if it means foregoing a full recovery for 
herself. However, in response to this, the Breeze family are the ones to answer the call. After having not received their party guests, they've been filled in and have already deployed Dr. Wheeler for support, who greets the group with a still shaky grasp of the metaphysical concept of broadband telepathy and a solid resolve to truly become a defender of Earth. With their situation seeming more urgent, it's decided that he should head for the boys, since he only needs to buy them enough time or a window big enough and get themselves healed as well. Then, eventually, they can swarm and overwhelm these invaders. A strategy cunning enough, the doctor praises his fellow tactical pacifist and Kami for coming up with it, but one Monaito begins to doubt is their most effective option, mourning now more than ever the lack of unity of the two halves that made up the child of Katas. Since when he finally finishes healing the Devil Man, he's unable to restore his vast energy to full in such a short time crunch, and thus the still unconscious fighter must be allowed to rest to recover the rest of the way naturally, showing the slug man from Planet Siri is certainly no Super Namiki when they explicitly need one most. At the same time, seeing Bardock is clamming up for some reason, Turtles looks past him to check on Gas, who despite the concern for his well-being, or rather, the meal ticket his well-being represents, tells the non-scarred Saiyan to bite him, which is amusing enough to bring that smug swagger back to Turles, who it turns attention to Bardock with a sigh, and a seeming heartfelt plea for his older brother to listen to him on this one, since he knows full well Bardock has a good thing going on here, and by no means does he intend for it to have to end. But unfortunately, he has to quote the likes of Freeze and Alec on this one, by saying that the taking of their home and innocent uninvolved lives is just business. He can always take his little family and run away to somewhere else, since running without concern for what he leaves behind is Bardock's specialty after all. Hell, Turles will even get his core of the heaters to help him scout out a new place, since in a weird way, he owes Bardock more than his brother could ever know. After all, if he'd done the same thing by dominating and exterminating all the life on this planet, it'd be a worthless barren rock, and he'd have absolutely no interest in it. But instead, he's not only found this little gold mine, but left it fertile and rich. So now, the Shinseiju, or Tree of Might, will likely produce the most potent fruit it has as of yet. So he, of course, has to thank his big brother for that. Hearing this, and having picked up on how the fruit worked partially by sensing the battle against Nappa, Bardock continues digging for info, asking why the quality of the fruit is so important if this has nothing to do with he and his. Once again showing a keen understanding of Bardock, Turles seems to sense this turmoil as he freely and quite proudly admits the impressive battle power he's reached in the time they've been away from one another. is isn't all his own doing or natural low-class potential. It's all thanks to the little wondrous fruit he's so worried about, and because of the massive abundance of them he's consumed in his continuous eating and destroying, he's hit some kind of inexplicable wall. So much so, no matter how many fruit of an average plant of Shinseichu he eats, he can only grow significantly stronger, as intended, by eating the most premium and potent of the fruit. Hence the surplus of regular fruit, which takes far less time to cultivate for a much grander yield. And of course, the resulting increase of the overall power in his crew beyond it simply being bigger. That's why the quality of the fruit matters so much. And more importantly, why the earth has to be the crushing heat alliance his next ground to sow and reap from. As Turles doesn't plan to keep on pillaging across the universe with no objective other than killing, eating, and drinking whatever he wants forever, eventually he'll grow beyond that 530,000 battle power Freeze is so proud of as to use it for deterrences and propaganda. And when that day comes, he'll kill that bastard in the most humiliating way possible before establishing his own empire, one which puts that of the Saiyans and King Code's wicked bloodline to shame. The sheer passion, bordering on mania that Turles conveys his vision with doesn't seem to move Bardock in the way Turles expected, even when he turns to him and eagerly insists that his new empire has a place for not just him, but his family as well. After all, his nephews have completed the challenge of surpassing Cognac far easier than they did, and he's certain Prince Vegeta would appreciate the company of peers his age, since they'd also be far closer to reviving the Saiyan race stronger than ever with him on their side, since he seems to be so eagerly taking after their father. For a moment, Turles continues to jabber on and on about the possible benefits and rewards their joining forces would bring about without an end in sight. That is, until Bardock forcefully barks at him to hold up a second, obviously still a bit overwhelmed in the first place, before pointing out massive issues with Turles' plan. Number one, if 530,000 wasn't far enough away as it is, Turles can't be dumb enough to still believe that's all Frieza has up his sleeves. He's been thinking about it for a long time now, and he's come up with another theory. That number, whether it's Frieza's full power or not, is simply just propaganda, while King Cold, whether because he didn't want to or need to, never revealed his power level. So its utility isn't to denote how strong the Emperor himself is. It's meant to dissuade any warriors prideful enough not to respect the power his wealth represents alone. So that means Turles will be farming fruit indefinitely if he wants to play things smart. And more importantly is number two. Bardock never agreed to stop living on or give up the Earth, nor did any of his family or friends, or even just the rest of the residents of the planet, like the other Earthlings, plants, and animals. This response makes Turles seem conflicted as he stresses that 
that Bardock can't afford to worry about this planet more than himself right now. Because once the tree is done with the Earth in a single year's time, not even a blade of grass will be able to grow in its soil for several centuries. That is, if the planet doesn't simply corrode and implode from the decay, it'll be a literal wasteland at best, and space dust at worse. So despite the sinister smirk that spreads across his brother's face, and the slight ramping up of his power, Turles insists that Bardock doesn't want to make him do things the hard way. While slyly, the scarred Saiyan produces something from his gi and chomps down on it before it can be noticed. This being the final sensu bean he retrieved for use in the tournament, its healing providing him with not only the return of his stamina, but also a thankfully well-earned, yet unfortunately subpar Zenkai, from the sheer strain outlasting gas placed on his body. As even with it, the gap between himself and Turles remains massive, unlike the list of options for a way out of this situation. Even so, with nothing left to do but fight and bite his time, Bardock initially charges at Turles, with everything he has on his own, and then stacks that by choosing to call on the spirit of the Saiyans again, only at the last minute, when he assumes the identical Saiyan is just about to speed behind him for a revenge counter. The offset of his attack tempo and quick spike in power catches Turles completely off guard, allowing Bardock to connect for a series of unexpected yet powerful attacks and techniques, like the blazing key and power punch of the Heat Phalanx, or the finisher key rush wave which he tries to send Turles flying away with. However, even so, the gap in power still leaves this all but effective, evidenced by Turles still standing right where he started, with that infuriating smirk, before burying a single fist in Bardock cut for a revenge counter of his own, which sends the older Saiyan staggering back and hacking up bloody vomit, which causes Turles to guffaw with genuine mirth and interest in the fight, commenting how that power Bardock is using sure is unique. However, it pales in comparison to the real power of a great ape, though giving at least some credit, he supposes using that and engaging in a battle of wits was how he beat Gas. Too bad it won't work on him, since his sheer curiosity at all the secrets and surprises his brother holds has earned Bardock his full attention now more than ever showing immense glee at the chance to hurt his brother. Despite Turles' assurances of feeling grateful towards Bardock for abandoning him on desert alongside their father, much like how Vegeta insists he is grateful towards Raditz for putting him in the position he's in now, the younger Saiyan suddenly charges with such force that his ominous key creates a giant looming pre-projection of the identical low-class warrior that it frightens Bardock before he is speed blitz somehow harder than Gas did earlier, alongside a chilling call that if he won't cooperate, Turles will dig Bardock's grave on this soon-to-be rust-colored desert of her planet, subsequently striking Bardock with his own key empowered punch, followed by a knee strike to the air. Then, after vanishing and appearing above him, he knocks his brother back to the ground hard, but without sending him on his lonesome, as he's soon followed by a full power energy wave barrage that slams and pelts into Bardock with enough continuous force to actually begin digging a divot into the ground with his body, as it takes everything Bardock has just to hold on. Meanwhile, despite his injuries, Nappa has merely been robbed of his ability to speak, not necessarily to move or fight at the moment, even if it pains him, so he is still ready and willing to stand at Vegeta's side. However, the prince very obviously doesn't need the aid, in fact, showing himself to not at all want it, to the point of being insulted by the silent offer, as he winds up ruthlessly and recklessly swiping his key at the ground the brute is standing on, to cause it to explode in a way not unlike the volcano explosion technique, as he barks that he has no use for a saint who can't even take out the low-class trash, revealing just how upset he is with his subordinate, even if Raditz made quite an improvement by leaving Nap unable to speak. But with this being only the first of what he has in store for the bald failure, the prince doesn't kill his underling yet. Though at the same time, he reveals that he's likely premeditated doing something like this to get rid of him for a while now. The heartbreak of this realization, along with the embarrassment of defeat and disposal, is what truly defeats Nappa, as the big bully loses consciousness, with tears streaming down his face pitifully. Having been amused by Raditz's groveling, Vegeta tells him he's free to move aside, so the prince can finish off Nappa. He'll even make it a good show as a reward for giving him one. But before he knows it, Raditz is taking a protective stance between Nappa and himself, while fairly confidently declaring that's enough from the prince. A sentiment Goku and Granola fiercely mirror, sparking devilishly, as if he's learned well from the likes of Turles and Elec how to play a long con. Vegeta states newfound respect for Raditz, in a way that is obviously disingenuous, in the very same breath, giving passive-aggressive words of recognition to the other alien fighters present, who he calls an even more worthless low-class runt and an inferior life form altogether. Since they want to play the hero, he'll be a gracious ruler and give them a sporting chance, as he reminds him that the core's objective here was to warn them and negotiate first. But since that is a no-go, the next order of business is to plant the Shinseiji, which he's been put in charge of. So here's the game. 
These weaklings don't need to beat him, they just need to take or destroy the seed he's been tasked with planting, as he even makes a show of revealing their target as an ornate pouch clipped to his belt. If they can do that, not only will they prevent the tree from being planted, but he'll even personally spare Nappa as they requested, and even convince Master Toes to leave the Earth alone. But if he completes his task, well, then he's going to kill these other two in front of Raditz as slowly and painfully as possible, which all things considered would be a mercy. After that, he'll force Raditz the Runt to return to his service, so he can keep him and Nappa both squirming under his heels as gophers, until they're finally allowed to die by his order as that's what they deserve for both holding him back and dragging him down when they were in the Frieza Force. Daunting as it is, this challenge at least offers a viable chance to thwart their adversaries, even if slim, which presents a conundrum, as battling Nappa has left them each with absolutely nothing of a tank. However, even if attempting to make their own retreat is the careful or smarter course of action, they decide to do what they feel is the right course of action, and so once again using their synchronicity, apply an evasionary skill they'd witnessed from Krum and the other students of the Crane School, as they accept Vegeta's offer with the solar flare that he's not at all ready for, on account of his sneering and leering at them so hard to revel in their glued states. But instead of worrying about swapping from defense to offense, they scatter, with Goku and Granola helping Raditz to clear Nappa's unconscious dead weight out of the way as quick as possible, mostly because having beaten the Brutan spirit him would be a lot less cool if he simply ended up mincemeat in the end. Seeing the trio clear the way, just as Dr. Wheelo, taking that they're disobeying orders, does his best to help and keep them safe by revealing his power from high in the air by attempting to snipe Vegeta from high above with a masterfully charged photon strike. The light of which is no less harsh on his eyes than the previous attack, which helps to stun Vegeta for a split second more, despite their power gap, in which the boys have already dropped off their incapacitated enemy and relative safety and returned. Seeing it as their bread and butter by this point, the boys fall into their usual formation of granola using long range support, while Goku and Redis charge in on either side for their favorite melee and close range key attacks, since this will give them a better chance to swipe and destroy the tree seat. However, even while having granola rain down the strongest and most precise key blast fall he can, in tandem with Radis and Goku. Goku's combo move, Vegeta is not being caught off guard any longer and simply vanishes behind their joint charge to elbow his fellow Saiyans brutally in the back with full intention to cripple them. Then, just as quickly, thanks to his scouter having logged that mystery power level of 18,001 that hit him from the sky earlier, he is prepared like the prodigy he is when it goes off again and a warning that Dr. Wheelo is marshalling his power for his gigantic bomber charging attack this time. However, Vegeta simply kicks one of Granola's stray blasts into him as he backsteps the doctor's charge so that he crashes into the ground and is left wide open for Vegeta to blow the limbs off his exosuit by precisely using his bang beam in order to also hit Granola on the other side as a bonus for being so pesky, which thankfully misses the doctor's brain and the cerulean as Granola hits the deck by diving to the side and clasping both hands together to fire something even stronger than the Super Dodon Ray, a Revenger cannon using everything he has left at the weakest point of Vegeta's body for a critical, critical hit, which strangely happens to be Vegeta's arm for some reason, at least seemingly so, as it's the very thing the prince uses to back Granola's strongest beam away uselessly, before suddenly closing the distance between them and stomping on the Cerulean's hands with a sickening, crackling crunch, which causes the alien sharpshooter to cry out in pain even more intense than when he lost his vision, before the prince then ruthlessly lunges his knee into the green-haired boy's face from his forced kneeling position, simultaneously knocking him out while breaking and dislocating his arms with ease for good measure. As this happens, and registers his powers as now poultry, Dr. Wheelow's mechanical constitution and devotion to the new friends who truly value him beyond his intellect is what keeps him going. Seeing the benevolent scientist resolve himself to a final act of atonement, even if it pains his no longer existent heart to do so against a child, brainwashed with evil or not. Regardless, he surges forward in robotic limbs that spark with malfunction as they begin to break further and tumble under his massive weight, allowing him to grapple and tackle Vegeta whilst charging up with him back into the atmosphere, setting his suit's internal system to overload and self-destruct with a little scoundrel in his clutches. But just before he can do so, he hears a familiar monkey boy's voice in his mind, asking his friend not to die. The hesitation it causes subsequently allows Vegeta to easily slip from this hold before placing a hand on the doctor's brain tank and blasting him back to the ground at point blank range, a look of disgust on his face. However, showing the same prince has also miscalculated and thinking that only nearly crippling them would be enough to keep the biological sons of Bardock down forever, as just as quickly having heard Granola in pain and registering that Dr. Wheelow nearly died and is more so about to blow himself to bits for the sake of their risky gamble, Goku and Raz have rallied a final time and become even more desperate, as when they charge in with an all-out attack this time, they order the Nimbus to obscure the bratty prince's vision and circle around sneakily to his blind spot respectively. Alone, these petty tactics born from time on Earth would have only further 
annoy the little Saiyan elite, but together they serve to obscure Vegeta's enemies and disrupt his focus enough that he both completely loses track of them and the true linchpin of what exactly he should be using his royal constitution to protect for the exact moment he needs it most. As just then, his tail is seized with all the physical strength left that Raditz can muster, actually succeeding in sapping his elite power, which leaves him vulnerable to be grappled and pummeled by Goku in a scuffle to take the real prize. The prince does his best to keep a hold of the pouch containing the seed in it, all without being able to see and only having three limbs to fend off two attackers fighting for keeps. Unlike Kakarot, who is solely focused on robbing him through this crazy monkey flurry. However, ultimately, the prince has enough strength left to ensure at least a draw on both fronts. As with a headbutt to both brothers, the seed is torn loose from the pouch and goes bouncing off the ground, heading towards a deep fissure in the earth created from Dr. Wheelow and Nappa's attacks. Instantly, Raditz panics and tells his youngest bro to leave holding the enemy to him and Nimbus, while he gets that seed, to which Goku wastes little time dashing and then diving after it. However, as Kakarot goes and Raditz threatens to remove his prince's Saiyan pride if he moves again, he's quite sure he hears Vegeta chuckle sinisterly. At the same time, Goku is racing as fast as he can to stop the seat before it does damage within the earth, when he finally loses track of the tiny thing of the dark, forcing him to try and sense it, though by now he's certain it's taken root. However, when he does find where it's implanted, instead of a young tree sproutling, a familiar cabbage head with beady red eyes pops out to give him the scare of his life, with Goku destroying the Cyberman in his shock and turning right around to zoom back up to the surface, where he hopes to rub it in Vegeta's face that he apparently made a mistake, only for the revelation of the mistake to have been theirs, as Vegeta is nowhere to be seen. While what is there is a thoroughly beaten and defeated rat lying not far away from the heap granola in Wheelow's tank fell, surrounded by a strange yellow smoke which wafts off them. A smoke Goku recognizes with horror as the destroyed Nimbus. That shock literally clouds his key sense for the moment and allows Vegeta to circle behind and backfist Goku directly in the chin hard enough that he sent Spiraling to join them, leaving the younger Saiyan in a defeated knockdown state as well before the prince cruelly smirks at him while sticking out and lifting his tongue, where the real Shinsei Ju seed safely lies. What Saiyan worth his tail would accept a sporting game or draw with soft-hearted, no-good, low-class, traitorous scum like these slow-witted fools? He's a super elite and the prince of all Saiyans after all. He only accepts absolute victory. If they wanted to win, they should have focused on taking his head off above all else. Enraged at this even dirtier trick than any his brothers have ever taught him, Goku growls with the painful shaking of his brain in his head that that wasn't the deal, as he struggles to maintain consciousness, if only for the sake of not allowing this smug prince to beat him in a staring contest too, just as Vegeta laughs and spits the seed into the ground to finally plant it, before subsequently tapping his scatter to report into Master Turles that he's finished up on his end, and is in fact about to clean up the trash he calls family for good measure, as he levels a key blast at Kakarot. But still refusing to give in, the low class brat begins fighting his own punch drunken state with sheer grit, unleashing attacks on his own legs, until they ultimately heed his order to stand and fight on longer as the last line of defense between this jerk and his friends, which Vegeta shows no hesitation to remove, as the sight and commotion of the act disgusts him even more than Wheelow, while also shocking Nappa awake. However, before Vegeta can, Nappa attempts to make up for his earlier fumble by going beyond his duties as with one hand clenching a shattered jaw, he sits back up to use the other for performing a final wide-range volcano explosion, and thus doing just as the prince said, by wiping out their enemies, as the entire area is obscured in a violent explosion of ki and a resulting dust storm. Seeing his kill taken, even if it was beneath him, Vegeta still finds a reason to admonish and literally kick Nappa while he's down, citing how the fool would have put the Tree of Might Sprout at risk with that move, if not for his guarding it so nobly and elitely. But by now having lost all interest, he simply says good riddance to Raditz, though this was more calculated by his former mentor than Vegeta would ever give him credit for, allowing the brute to play off his mistake as his usual bumbling idiocy, even without the ability to speak. A thought shared by Raditz, as he teeters on the edge of consciousness, having thankfully been saved by what he wants to believe, was his own old mentor and bully repaying the debt of sparing his life with a purposely inaccurate version of an attack he always bragged didn't require aiming since it simply wiped out all life in its blast radius. Well that, and the quick thinking and humility of Kakarot, who was smart and kind enough to know when to take the chance to not only run, but also grab the rest of his allies by placing Granola and Raditz on Dr. Willow's thankfully still mostly intact tank. That way, he could carry them all away on foot and take advantage of their enemy being completely scatter reliant, whilst they barely have any key left to suppress. Huffing and puffing as he zips away carrying so much weight, Goku can't help but be the angriest he's ever been, noting how he finally gets how Raditz wound up the way he is, if that guy used to be his best friend. Acclaimed the long-haired Saiyan even nearly dead from his wounds takes umbrage with, saying he's not my best 
best friend. To which Goku replies that yeah he knows, Granola's his best friend now. While said Cerulean, being in just about the same, or worse shape, urgently hushes the two, lamenting their constantly middling stealth skills, and having it noted for the record that if his and Vegeta's roles were reversed, the pincushion would be dead and he'd be the one laughing. At the same time, on the lookout, Hine finishes up her healing, and as a result, receives her own invigorating Zenkai. While thanks to knowing the full scoop with Kami's play-by-play and her key sense, she takes the lead from here when asking Mr. Popo to give her a lift to the boys and Dr. Wheelow so they can get them back, which he readily obliges. Seemingly repeating the same tactic which got the youthful fighters in this mess, the mother Saiyan decides to go keep Vegeta from coming after them once his scouter alerts them to their presence, and for a shot at destroying that stupid Sprout. This means when she arrives with Popo, she wastes little time in soaring to Vegeta and Nappa's location at Tots B, where it's clear her anger has finally won out over her conflicting emotions, thanks to the state her loved ones and home have been left in. In response to seeing her, Vegeta scoffs his disbelief. Nappa allowed himself to fail his mission for the sake of a mere woman, but just as soon as he vocalizes his insult, Kine's spirit of the Saiyans flares to life with what can only be described as a greater mastery than anyone has achieved for the technique thus far. Using the extra power granted as true overkill, the woman speed blitzes the youthful prince with enough force that he's confused and terrified by the number his scouter reads far before she closed the distance. Then with a paradoxically gentle laying of her hand on the back of the royal pain's head, which is tragically one of the only times Vegeta has known a mother's touch. She drives her knee into the little prince's breadbasket hard enough to send him flying through a mountain or two before he's embedded deep in a third by the sheer shockwave inducing force of one of her heavy finishes, settling his payback on this self-proclaimed big bad boss for her boys, reminding that she's also a Saiyan, and more importantly, Vegeta is just a child. Hence the only reason he's getting the last of her mercy. Turning her glare on Nappa, however, she confirms that all his aggression has seemingly disappeared. Thus, she orders him to take his prince and leave while he can. As with way more important fish to fry, she goes after the Shinseiju Sprout. But before she can reach it, Key Blast from above rain down to impede her and herald the arrival of Turtles' ship along with the rest of his Crusher Corps. The powers of which combined could easily overwhelm her and seeing no need to be taken hostage or held at a disadvantage like the boys, she reluctantly retreats to rendezvous and returns to the lookout with Popo and they're injured. Meanwhile, though it's rather slow on account of his hurt body and pride, Vegeta claws his way out of the rubble with a screech that Master Turles is going to kill them all. A claim Gina hears and is suddenly frozen by disbelief, as though Bardock failed to mention that name in regards to who he was fighting now. Hine has heard him utter it before. Granted, he had been drunk, but it was one of the only three times she's seen Bardock shed tears in her entirety of knowing it, so it was hard to forget. Regardless, that may just have been their saving grace, as once they return to the lookout, it's with plans to go after Bardock immediately after, since maybe she can remind the two Saiyan men that they shouldn't be fighting like this, and that there's still time to take all this back to make peace. But when they arrive, it's to the sound of Muesli crying out in anger and despair for some reason. Initially, at what Gine assumes is the sight of the terrible state Granola was left in, and with how mangled his hands appear, here, even Gine worries that the young hunter she helped raise will ever be able to shoot straight again. But when she makes her way over to check on her partner in the Mr. Monaito's treatment, they all learn that much like Granola did upon first awakening his forbidden red eye, Muesli has also lost her sight for what will hopefully be temporary. Uniquely though, in this moment of realizing the loss of one of her most precious senses and the resulting powerlessness it makes her feel, Muesli begins to panic about as much as Gine and their other companions. However, with everyone out of harm's way on the lookout, it's a lot easier to focus on the one still in danger being Bardock. As in a heartfelt and vulnerable manner, seldom seen from the scarred man, his two loves begin to hear Bardock's voice loud and clear, even though he sounds weaker than they've ever heard him. Regardless, he expresses grateful relief that they've all escaped to safety successfully, or he implores them to stay no matter what happens. But predictably, neither woman is open to such an idea. In fact, they rebuke it rather wrathfully, with Gine doing her best to put her foot down more assertively than she ever has before, which these days is really saying something, as the lookout itself begins to quake under her protests, while Muzi pragmatically questions what on earth that's good could possibly come from them abandoning Bardock now. If they don't all get it together, the earth is screwed, dummy. However, as hopeless as he is, he needs at least one of them to understand this. Speaking directly to Muesli as that ironically hopeful one, he begs her to stop Gine from trying to help him, as everyone will follow. Turles is too far gone to reason with, so please just keep everyone right where they are while he tries to fix this on his own. However, still showing both Saiyan stubbornness and a relatively cooler head than her non-warrior background would have originally granted, Muesli insists to the Saiyan men that they have to get back out there, as it's what Bardock would do for them, whether they liked it or not. So how could she stop Gine much less herself? Even if she has to fight blind or ask the Namekians how to see with her ears and key sense better, she knows this is just his stupid pride talking. But in a seriously distressed tone that she hasn't heard from him since meeting 
the Scarred Soldier on Planet Serial. Bardock suddenly reminds her of the day she died, and the fact that he tried to fight Gas with all he had as retribution. But that was dangerous, and in the end, put not just his life in danger. As strange and backwards as it may sound, Moosley dying that day kept Granola and Manito alive. His running away gave his family a fighting chance to escape the destruction of Planet Vegeta, and eventually, even to save her family. He hates it almost more than he's ever hated his circumstances before, but has also become wise enough to recognize they can't win this one. Now without a sacrifice, and not today, especially if Turles is still around to protect that tree. Hence, he needs her to promise him she'll stop everyone from coming to his aid, no matter what. As with the seed already planted, they're only wasting strength and effort trying to stay on the offense. Besides, even if they could all get patched up and muster up enough strength to take on Turles, he'd be sure to use the power of the Uzar to take away their advantage, something he's certain she's already caught on to. As they are now, he doubts they could match them using the true power of the Saiyans, especially with so few of them having full control. This is the best case scenario to ensure the least amount of them have to die. Finding herself for once unable to argue with the man she's only just admitted her feelings to, Moosley clams up and goes quiet entirely, while at the same time, DNA 2 recognizing the clock they're on can't waste any further time checking on her, and so turns her back with a promise that everything will be okay once Monaito finishes his treatment and everyone is back together. But when she does, she is left completely off guard to Moosley suddenly blindsiding her in a coldly collected manner to strike a pressure point in her neck, which knocks her out gently, at which point, the blinded Cerulean catches her and slides to the ground with tears streaming down her face, just as Bardock thanks her. Then, resisting the urge to choke up any further, she relays Bardock's final request to everyone at the lookout, please let him die alone, a message which rocks all our heroes to their cores, as at this point, their greatest champion and the greatest adversary to date have both left them no other choice but to accept this sacrifice for their sake. Meanwhile, as he continues to berate and bash Bardock about making a choice, both figuratively and literally through the methodical stomping on the destruction of each of his individual ribs, Turles finally receives the updates of the tree being planted and the other fighters retreating with their tails between their legs. After thorough trouncings, Bardock, while trying to muster more strength, suddenly gets flashed of his life and the people in it, a spark of the relief he felt buried in all that manic anger when he first managed to get his family onto Earth. The big stupid grin he couldn't get off his face that first night after realizing he succeeded in reviving Moosley and helping Granola and Manito, with the pride he's begun to take in his sons and family as his own legacy. He initially struggles to understand how these memories can help him now, but then it clicks as if it's the most natural thing in the world, an inclination even more compelling than his Saiyan blood, the sheer unadulterated desire to lay down his life before he'd let anything happen to any of them. But seeing that enough is enough and he's not convincing anyone, Terrellis doesn't give any further chances, simply deciding to end his brother's life with his point blank calamity blaster, so that wherever they are, those his brother cares for so much will see the pillar of light that ended him, a much grander death than his brother abandoned him to, and thus one in which Turles still believes he's being merciful in his own way. However, from Turles' erupting geyser of energy, so too comes a strong uppercutting blow and an equally fierce power, as with a sudden deranged grin of his own, Bardock emerges looking more than half dead, but even so, surges his raging ore to his full power like never before, as suddenly, even Turles' power can't quite keep him down as he just decides to take whatever is dished out to him for the sake of landing far more substantial blows, surprising both Saiyans in the process, as by drawing on his life force and devotion to others, Bardock has finally been able to get enough power to challenge Turles by just fighting like something that's already dead, as he simply can't miss the ending of this fight, desperately wanting to see both these Saiyans killed brutally as more than worthy sport. Gas has made his way slowly to the new battlefield, but had the impromptu stage transition with the sight of Bardock in this new horrific state, both terrifying and transfigured as he can't help but covet such unyielding power. At the same time, around the world, those touched by Bardock and the Sonchun serial clan whether possessing a conscious key sense or not, also come to recognize vaguely what is happening, almost as if they can quietly hear the Earth itself weeping for a champion to save it. In utter shock and disgust, Turles contemptuously recognizes the seemingly impossible, that magic planet or not, somehow his brother is still around, to which Bardock replies in a ragged, gnarly voice that it won't be for much longer, just like him, with the resulting amp in his energy being enough for the Earth defending Saiyan to pull off a final revenger at shocking speed, as he continues to knock Turles higher and higher into the air with increasingly vicious and desperate attacks, until fully turning the tides and seeing the two of them hurtling towards the location of the Shinsei Ju Sprout and the rest of Turles' men, at which point, the final attack of this brutal technique empowered by a near undead constitution, sees the half-dead scarred Saiyan knock his doppelganger down to earth with a hammer fist which breaks his own arms thanks to the force his brother has sent plummeting towards his crew and precious little tree with, as he struggles to recover in the air. However, to Bardock's dismay, his younger sibling succeeds just before he's too close for comfort, riding himself and skidding 
leading to a near catastrophic stop for the young plant, snarling back at his brother and finally releasing his own full power in a kill driver, which he rushes back to deliver from as close a range as possible. A challenge Bardock fully accepts as he prepares a final spirit cannon, which he too charges with. So fast, in fact, he practically dives through Turles' technique with no concern for himself, protecting his key blast from being canceled out, even if it means withstanding the resulting explosion, which consumes his body and pushes even Turles back with a satisfied smirk, as surely this time he's done it. However, to his absolute horror, Bardock's Key Blast survives and continues on his path from the resulting smoke cloud, heading directly for the likes of Vegeta and the rest of the Crusher Corps, guarding the Shinsei Juice Sprout with no hopes whatsoever surviving an attack from Bardock in this state themselves. And worse, this isn't the end of the gambit for the zombified Saiyan embodying the vengeful spirit of their race, as he too continues his charge from the smoke while Turles is distracted, even if he now appears closer to our charred corpse of skeleton, whilst even through destroyed vocal cords. Bardock proudly chants words which have yet to leave his lips, but which he has come to truly trust in because of faith and fate, as a proverbial shield of not just the Earth but of his family, just as Grandpa Gohan, Gine, Raditz, and Kakarot have before him. Words which now put fear into even Turles' heart, as despite losing his scouter, he can almost tell innately that this will hurt. Ka me ha me uh. Then. Just as suddenly as it spiked, fate cruelly rewards Turles' faith in himself and his tree over Bardock's mercy and love, as the last embers of Bardock's life burn out and his all-out struggle comes to a conclusive end, his body simply unable to handle the strain he's placed on it any further, as he begins to break down and crumble into nothing. Suddenly catching himself exhausted due to the fairly moderate injuries he's been left with, Turles is still shaken by his brother's final moments. So much so, he first has to check that the moisture he feels growing on his face isn't tears or sweat of his own. Though just as he wonders this, he notices the sky is clouded with a brewing thunderstorm hailing rain. It'll be nourishing for the sprout to begin soaking up all the planet's water. As a result of a jitter or diet's scheming, he assumes, rather than attempting to withstand it individually, Trailers' crew are wise enough to band together in order to deflect Bardock's desperate attack. Of course, his brother and his weak, worthless sentiments can never make him sweat or show emotion. That's obviously why he feels so dissatisfied with this inevitable yet absolute victory. And as a result, it makes him all the more eager to get off this soon to be dead planet, spitting his parting words for his brother that it's a shame he didn't meet the rest of the family. But he's sure they'll be well acquainted before the year's out. With their work done, the core feel no need to argue this sentiment. However, as the tree will be vulnerable until it's more mature, it's decided that Nappa and Gaz will extend their duties as envoys into guards. Since they lost their fights they weren't meant to start in the first place after all, they may as well spend their time proverbially watching grass grow, as he will need someone to hang back for the year with the task of being stewards and protectors to the Tree of Might, as unlike the ones which grow instantly, someone could theoretically sabotage it, and they've already drawn the short end once. At the same time, this is also a perfect excuse to get rid of these two rather insubordinate ill fits for his crew for the year. That won't force him to run back to heater space or kill something else unworthy of its power, just yet at least. And with everyone on the planet already having a death sentence, both Saiyan and Heater are given carte blanche to slaughter and pillage who or whatever they need in order to make it through the year, until they return to pick them and the ripened fruit up. Of course, Turles insists menacingly rather than the somewhat solemn melancholy he has suddenly taken on. If anything happens to his tree or fruit before he returns, there will be worse hell to pay than being stranded on a dying world. Still a bit shaken himself, Gas speaks for he and Nappa, as uncharacteristic as that is, considering the circumstances, asking what their orders are for the notable remnants of the planet. With a bitter scoff, Turles supposed that his brother did after all give his life for his family and the people of this world, so the least he can do is leave at least them to either die out naturally or figure out some way off this dirt ball, as impossible as that is, his lack of care giving away just how disappointed he is with the outcome of this latest conquest, despite how eager he had been beforehand, since without another word, he boards the ship, thus giving the cue for the rest of the crew to follow it, as with little time wasted in takeoff preparations, the invaders depart with plans to return in a single year's time.